back for another episode of uh, uh, This Is Learning, This Is Tech Talks. We have uh, Santosh and, and Lars, and then our, our guest, Ryan. Um, I'm Jay. Well, it's awesome to have you back, Ryan. Um, I'm excited to learn about Solid today. I've never actually used Solid. I think I've, Santosh and Lars, have you guys written much or any Solid in the past? I just wanted to ask, like, of course, uh, if I see Solid, like the, the version 1.0 came like two years ago, right? And uh, it's been two years now. So what what is team working on in this two years? And are you expecting any major releases? We're back. OK, uh, back for another episode of uh, uh, This Is Learning. This is Tech Talks. Um, we have uh, Santosh and, and Lars and then our, our guest, Ryan. Um, I'm Jay. Uh, how is everybody doing today? Great. Someone, I'm going to nominate you? someone if you don't speak up. I <laughs> Yep. Lars, how, how, how's it going over there? Uh, I'm ready to talk to Ryan. It's been a while. Good. Well, I've never talked to Ryan, so I'm also excited to talk to Ryan. I don't think we've ever talked, have we, Ryan? I, no, I don't believe so. But yeah, Lars did one of my very first podcasts, I think. Um, might have been the first podcast um, that we ever did on Solid. So I'm very, very stoked to come here and talk with him again. Amazing. How long ago was that? Ooh, uh, early 2020, I want to say, like March 2020-ish time period, I think. Uh, yeah, nice. Yeah, sounds about yes. right. And you were, I think you were even on this show also uh, yeah. about a year ago or so, yeah. a year and a half, maybe. Yes. Yeah, probably two years because that's when we started, right? 2021. Mm -hmm. And we did our first season. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's awesome to have you back, Ryan. Um, I'm excited to learn about Solid today. I've never actually used Solid. Um, I think, I've, Santosh and Lars, have you guys written much or any Solid in the past? Or just when Ryan comes on the show and then you go write a little bit afterwards? I tried it before it became popular. I, I really saw some potential in it years ago. So I was always promoting Ryan's stuff and I was edit editing articles and he was an early joiner contributor to this is learning the publication nice and uh yeah it's just been growing and growing like ryan you have so much going on now and that's that's amazing to witness yeah no no it's it, it was it's good this this is learning um I, I had a lot of educational content that i wanted to put out um that was the biggest challenge as a framework author trying to go out there and promote solid initially was mm -hmm. I, I came on twitter and was like you know people would say stuff and i'm like no that's not quite right and then I'd like try and like correct them or like show them other ways. And people weren't really open to that. Right. You know, it's like, you know, they feel like you're hijacking, especially because I wasn't, no one knew who I was at the time. So like you can picture like th this guy signed up for Twitter two months ago. Why, why is he um, disagreeing with Evan, you or Rich Harris about this? And then like the swarm of like, you know, framework fans coming in and, I, I had a funniest conversation in my early Twitter days where someone was trying to explain to me that JSX wasn't compiled. Like that, like JSX was like, like somehow some magic thing that just worked. And, and they, they were, people were like flagging people from frameworks and all this stuff. And I'm just, man, like it became immediately obvious to me that I, I would never be able to get solid out there and that people like would try it unless I spent a lot of time on education, um, which mm -hmm. was the beginning. I started writing on Medium and that's where um, in-depth uh, publication on Medium show was and they, I started writing for them and that's how I first met Lars and then next thing I know, This Is Learning was there and I pretty much almost all my educational content now that I write, I publish through Dev2 on This, this Is Learning. Nice. That's awesome. So you purposely threw yourself through the gauntlet at the start then of the the uh, internet Twitter mob on JavaScript frameworks. <laughs> I, I just didn't know better. Like I, I'd, I'd been a guy who'd kind of kept his head down. I was like working on things I liked. And then I was like, okay, I have something really cool to show. You know, it's winning benchmarks. It has, you know, I think a really nice model. It's clean. It doesn't have, you know, hook rules or a lot of this other stuff. And it like seems like it makes a lot of sense. So I started like trying to put it out there. And then like it, it, it didn't matter anything that I claimed. People would be just like, no, you know, can't do, uh, uh, what does it call it? Analysis, like compiler analysis on JSX. No, that's impossible, right? React tried that and failed, you know? So they, then they played the guy from the React team to be like, look, this guy says he can do, you know, compiler analysis on JSX. 
you know, like that's actually, you know, one of the first times I had a really good conversation with Dominic Ganaway, um, who now works on Svelte, um, because he had worked on Inferno and he was working a compiler for React. And, you know, people on Twitter were like, this guy says he could do what you couldn't do, you know, and it's like, no, we're, we're solving slightly different problems. Dominic had my back then and it was good, but like early Twitter days, like there's a lot of reputation. There's a lot of like people who, you know, are in the know and especially people who are one tier removed. Like there's people who work on the frameworks. They're always, you know, relatively humble. They work really hard. They spend all the time trying to work through these complicated problems. They understand there's trade-offs. And then, you know, there's at the other end, you have, you know, a lot of these developers who are consuming this content, consuming the content using the frameworks. In the middle are is this tier of like influencer types and some of them are educators. I'm not going to say good or bad for it, but there are people who can take the message that I'm not always so good at explaining and make it more consumable for other people. And um, that was where I hit the biggest <laughs> initial obstacle because there was a whole system of these people who knew frameworks and what I had come out to say at the beginning sounded like it shouldn't be possible or that it like flies in the face of what they knew. So yeah, I had no choice but to try and like step back um, uh, and focus on education, like going on Twitter and telling people that they are nuanced, slightly mistaken in their interpretation, that they're mostly right, except for in this case is a very hard thing to do. So um, yeah, I, I just gave up. I'm just like, right, right, right. If people want to have answers, they want to understand these things, you got to spend a little bit more time on it and actually show them how things work. And I'm, I'm glad I did that because while that served I initially was kind of just a base for me, just like getting my thoughts out. Like, you know, I'd been working on a framework for a couple of years then in the dark, so to speak, like without being on social, without even publishing it on open source. Solid started back in 2016. Um, so at first it was just getting all like what I learned out there. But later on, um, this became a like education teaching tool f for, you know, advanced concepts across all frameworks. And ultimately, I feel became the foundational piece for people actually picking up signals in pretty much every JavaScript framework. It was that mm -hmm. that basis of work and writing that I'd done to educate people on signals over the years. Yeah, well, I mean, props for keeping going, right? Like if, if we didn't challenge what we originally knew, we wouldn't get anywhere, right? If people weren't trying to push the bounds and trying to, and you even, you weren't even like, purposely trying to do what other people weren't doing you just like kind of accidentally did that without even knowing that's what you were doing but then you just kept on going so <laughs> props yeah i mean i knew i had stuff i liked right that's what mm -hmm. i knew I, I i was a knockout js developer i i always there's two frameworks that i mention every time i'm on a podcast or a live stream and people make fun of me for it one's knockout js and the other one's marco um and both of these frameworks are um, were very very ahead of their time and had a huge influence on how Solid ended up. And um, in my case, with Knockout, it had the pieces, it just had some gaps. And what happened was there's a lot of, not a lot, but there's a number of frameworks that were kind of like Knockout back in the day, this reactive model with kind of fine-grained updates and DOM. And they had like two-way binding and they had like, templates in the HTML, they're kind of messy and they, they weren't performant. And instead of us fixing or addressing that model, um, the whole ecosystem turned on its head and went to React, essentially, like we just kind of swapped. And when that happened, um, it wasn't just, uh, you know, people adopting React. I mean, other frameworks, everyone was like, okay, screw this reactivity model, or let's still use a, let's put it, take a reactivity model and hide it as plain objects and then use a VDOM, or let's, you know, maybe don't use reactivity, but still use like this top down diffing. The whole industry moved towards this idea of like re-rendering components. Um, you know, let's use compilers to optimize that re-rendering. And people got away from uh, signals, which are basically like an event based system. And obviously events, as anyone who's used events or even used other reactivity like RxJS knows, can be a bit messy because things can fire all over the place. But the truth is these fine-grained mechanisms um, had guards against that. They Not initially, I guess, but the API lent to it. And as early as MobX or Mobservable originally in 2015, we had solutions to these problems, but the whole ecosystem had moved on. So I was just like, what if we took something like MobX 
took that fine grain rendering from Knockout and used the modern tooling that we've come to expect from, you know, React, uh, would we have, you know, something good? And the answer to that, I think, uh, at this point is pretty definitively yes. It sounds like yes from everything I've heard about Solid, for sure. Yeah, so I mean, it is it is interesting to see that um, that progression kind of go full circle now. Where, like, as I said, like there there have been reactive frameworks over the years. Vue um, always gets kind of passed by. They, they you can tell people the Vue community often are like, we had signals first, and uh, yeah, you, you you guys did have signals first. You know the reactivity, but. People didn't notice because it was behind an object in the options API or a VDOM that was doing this re-rendering. Um, and part of that was just the, the climate. Um, the two most popular frameworks coming out of 2013-14 time period both had a sort of anti-signals kind of mentality behind them, right? And what I mean by that is you had React, which had this re-render model, which doesn't you know, re-render models kind of in contrast to models where you like build a reactive graph and just update what changes. No, you just throw stuff away and you re-render, except in React's case, use a VDOM to make it, you know, reasonably performant. And on the other hand, uh, Angular, um, generally uh, with like zone JS and stuff, it was a framework based on plain objects. Um, again, mm -hmm. so everybody was using stuff that looked like plain objects, whether you're calling set state on it or had some other kind of, you can just mutate it directly. You, you were dealing with stuff that looked like plain objects. People didn't want to think about data as being special. Like, don't get me wrong. Angular had RX, um, JS with Angular 2. And we got to this whole, you know, system that was using, I, I think a lot of times for piping the services together, but I, at least initially to my understanding, um, RxJS served more as like uh, glue rather than like the core mechanism for uh, for change management within the framework. And so we kind of gotten away from the signals thing. And it's very interesting to see that now that we have the new constraints in place, people have seen that it can work, that a lot of frameworks are looking at how they can take the signals um, and use them in a way that's more fine-grained again. Svelte 5 is an example of basically they compile to almost the same as Solid's rendering model. View Vapor is another one. I remember when Evan Yu went on stage the first time to show that off, and I was looking at. He's like, "Look, we do this, and we compile this." And I'm like, "I thought I was looking at Solid code." Um, <laughs> that that one isn't out yet, but next year, you know, Svelte Five isn't quite out yet, but it'll be coming out early next year. Um, so like there, th that's on the, and I think even frameworks like Angular trying to get there. Like the first step is you adopt the signals, right? You you get them in there, and everyone now. Um, except React, I think, has some version of signals. We have, you know, Preact signals, Quick signals, Angular signals, um, and then obviously Solid, View, and Svelte that I just mentioned. Um, and even Lit um, has integrations now with single libraries. Um, oh. They have one with Preact. So, like, we're seeing the, the, that first stage of adoption, adopting the signals almost completely done. But now we're hitting the second stage with, like, now that we have signals, can, what can we do with them? And the obvious answer for a lot of people is, like, what solid been doing the last five years because that is the way to get that um leverage the signals for performance and for even execution model because like i built the library off signals like like i didn't have any other system i didn't have a different renderer i started mm -hmm. from scratch on like how can i best opt build a framework built on signals so we are seeing that second phase coming in um now which is really exciting because that that's why um you know, this kind of acknowledgement now that like, this is a real thing. Um, we're seeing, you know, TC39 having meetings about bringing signals into the browser. We're seeing, you know, even it even coming up in conversations on the React side where they're saying, okay, we don't want reactivity exposed to the end user, but um, there was a rebranding of the, I, I want to call it rebranding of the React forget compiler where they went from saying like, this is an auto memoizing compiler to an auto reactivity compiler. And again, this might be just perception thing, but there's a lot of talk of like, are they doing more fine grained style updates under the hood of this compiler? Um, you know, so having seen Svelte 5 and the way it uses a compiler, it's not far to, you know, consider like if you went a little bit further on trying to hide stuff, um, you might be able to get to something that, you know, even in a React model, could use this kind of reactivity in the hood. I don't know personally if React forget is using something like signals under the hood for sure. 
but it, they have hinted at it at various points, um, you know, even on Twitter that it was something that was under consideration. So um, I think there is a desire for granularity. That's why React released uh, Fiverr. I think people are getting to a point where it feels like you shouldn't have to sacrifice um, your DX to get your UX, you know, that there is a path forward here. And it seems that we're kind of arriving on this mechanism of fine-grained updates, uh, fine-grained reactivity signals, whatever you want to call them, as this ability um, to achieve that. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, of course, uh, if I see Solid, like the, the version 1.0 came like two years ago, right? And uh, it's been two years now. So what what is team working on in this two years? And are you expecting any major releases? Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> This has been an interesting one because as a, I, I'm kind of slow on on releases. I'm very careful. Solid only went to 1.0 in 2021, and that's that's why I came on the sh show last time because I just released 1.0, yeah. and that was, you know, in I, I I when I look at tools and other frameworks out there, I I realized I mean not even hindsight it was kind of intentional, but like Solid could have gone 1.0 in. 2019. The API hasn't actually changed since the end of 2018. I just waited uh, almost two and a half years um, because I wanted to make sure that all the other pieces fit properly. Um, biggest thing that I did not have in consideration when I originally uh, built Solid was server-side rendering. I had built Solid to be fast client-side library, fast for updates, had a really nice mental model, very composable. You could build stores and different kinds of mechanisms and behaviors, you know, by just composing, aggregating these pieces together um, and really nice. But SSR was not on on, on the, my original, you know, perspective. And a lot had changed in those couple of years between 2016 and 2019 or whatever. SSR had become the thing. Everybody was like, you know, the rise of Next.js and that. And... I wanted to make sure that I had the right model for SSR, um, so to speak. And that's where a lot of the influence from Marco came in because Marco had been doing SSR incredibly well. They had islands and, you know, all the streaming and all these things that we, you know, the big hits of 2020, they had them in 2014, six years before pretty much everyone else. So uh, working at eBay during that time period and informing SSR really showed me how far behind the gambit the whole JS community was on server side oh, yeah. rendering. And I didn't want to release solid until I knew that it was at a place where I at least had an idea of what SSR should look like. Um, so actually the last couple of years have largely been spent on SSR um, after, even though I'd kind of figured stuff out in a decent place for, you know, 2021 release, I've been working a lot on a meta framework for solid um, uh, kind of like a Next.js or Svelte kit um, because it's so important to people to have these kind of, you know, here's the package with all the pieces together. It's it's pretty easy to get a client-side framework up and running. You just kind of, you know, import something, maybe a script tag, and then you just like call render on something. And yeah, there's more tooling to do the builds and stuff. Um, but we got to a point where if you had the Webpack config, you were good to go. SSR is trickier than just one webpack config. And Vite has done a really good job of making it basically one config again, but it's not enough to just build the project. You have to have it run, you know, on Node or on your Cloudflare worker or, you know, on your Netlify function or Vercel or whatever. And there's a whole bunch of gaps there because once you take over that domain well you're not just dealing with things that matter in the browser like sure you can server render it but now you have to concern yourself with how you respond to handle redirects on the server sessions cookies you know authorization all this kind of stuff that that you know we didn't really spend as much time on so you know i i made the mistake or whatever that when I, when I started so I saw v2 and I was like okay finally I got a server set up this shouldn't take me this should only take me a couple months and I built it and I'm like okay pretty happy and then I realized that like you you just can't offer that you need to offer the whole gambit and mm. um this sent me on a journey two years ago um where the first piece I realized was that the the model that we built on um, kind of like Jamstack where you had JavaScript and APIs needed to evolve mm. Um, we were starting to see edge functions 
that could get more performance or bring stuff closer to the end user. And these like classic API endpoints that we've been using for a while, while they work, they seem clunky. And I, what I was realizing is like, I was a .NET developer during the 2000s. Um, so I was working full stack, C sharp, VB.NET projects, and we controlled the whole side. And it was it was messy. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I call it the dark ages sometimes um, because of like, we had these like partial update panels, but it was a single model. Like essentially you'd write all your code in say C sharp, and then it would generate JavaScript. And then the pages would like post back and do this thing. And you would basically have this one unified model lifecycle where you basically do like you'd have the server render it, the client would pick it up and then server would get it again. And then you kind of it flowed through and you could do either full page reloads or partial page reloads, but it was like one model. And it was because we controlled both sides. And now obviously controlling both sides with C sharp had issues because C sharp does not run in the browser. Um, and I'm, I'm not getting into web assembly at the moment, but what, I, what I'm getting at is the difference with JavaScript on both sides um, is that like we do have control on both ends. And I was like, I need, why can't I just ask for something from the server and have it run? I just needed some kind of function. I, I just needed like, why can't, I, and I know RPCs are bad. I used SOAP back in the day with Microsoft, you know, these name functions it seems terrible versioning. Like I, there, there are issues with RPCs, but I'm like, these are being developed and shipped as a single application. Like they're basically okay. like a single, like more so than even those old .NET projects. Probably no time in our history of web have we been able to so closely integrate this isomorphic environment as when we had JavaScript on both sides. So at a certain point, I like it was actually very early on. I think it was actually in 2022, like right at the beginning of 2022, I, I implemented this kind of proxy-based ability to call functions on the server or call them from the client and hide a fetch call. I was, I was doing this crazy thing with proxies that if I went down the path, of the proxy, it would generate the URL for, for me. So you'd be like api.user. whatever, and that would be the URL you'd hit. And then that would be in the file system running on the server where you put the file that would actually get called. Um, luckily, I ran into a young developer who just started on Solid. He His first project was to make a 3D render in Solid. He used our universal render to actually make like 3D game. And nice. he was like, he, he, he was like, it's kind of like he, he ported React 3, basically, um, React 3 Fiber or whatever. He ported it to Solid in about a, his first week and a half of using Solid. And we were just like, wow, this guy's crazy. Well, he got involved with the Solid Star project and he said, Ryan, why don't we just compile it? Like, why are you like doing all this fancy like proxy stuff? We can just write a function here, write a function here and you know, just call it wherever we want. If it's on the server, it just calls on the server. It's on the client. It does a fetch in the background. And yeah, we uh, so May 2022, we basically implemented this server function mechanism, and I really liked it because I I looked at a couple things like Remix, which had loaders and actions, and what always bugged me was that the loaders, yeah, you go to a page, you you get the data, right? We're pretty used to that. You render your page, but the actions bugged me because, like in the classic REST style actions you can only like do the one action for URL you can put or you can post to it. And then like, it makes it sense because you like know where the things are, like there's a set rule, but a lot of operations are more complicated than that. If you've ever tried to move something between two resources, it's like, it's not a single rest out action. It's not just a put here or a post here or delete here. It's like, it's multiple actions. And having used GraphQL, I really liked the the way GraphQL had the graph when you pulled the data, but then it basically had a bunch of RPC calls when you posted. So I kind of emulated that architecture with these server functions to create uh, like a single get, you know, mechanism using the URL, and then basically these RPC um, action server functions, and. That was pretty big for us. I, I know I'm getting hyper detailed there, but it had a big impact because, again. After Solid Start um, kind of showed the capability of this, um, uh, I guess, summer 2022, uh, we saw the show up uh, about a few months later in Next.js, and then we <laughs> saw it show up in Quick. And this kind of started the beginning of this new age of, of being able to kind of, I don't want to call it code extraction, where you could basically, mm -hmm. you know, t define 
where your code runs like does it like maybe runs at build time maybe it runs on the server maybe it runs in the browser maybe it runs in a worker um and this is important because the biggest drawback historically of monoliths is that you know it's it's so coupled you, you you can't scale your architecture like your infrastructure underneath it and what we kind of want these days is monolithic authoring with distributed deployment and th th this this has kind of become the key to that that we've seen arise so yes um very long-winded way of getting to what i've been working on because over i've been trying to build a meta framework essentially that isn't a meta framework uh is the best way to put it and what i mean by that is i didn't want it to be too opinionated there during this time period when everyone's been focused on meta frameworks even react has sort of kind of pushed hard in that direction like the react core team told everyone that hey if you want to use react these days don't use create react app don't use Vite. use a meta framework use remix use next use gatsby um i it didn't sit right with me so i've been trying to see if it's possible to basically elevate the bottom line create a meta framework which has primitives uh, essentially the same way that we attacked uh the, the javascript framework you know with primitives like the, the key strength of solid js wasn't just like this fine-grained rendering performance it was that you feel like you're in control we give you the signals we give you the pieces that wire it together and the the makes the behavior more explicit i wanted to take that approach to meta frameworks so much to the point that you know it's been a long journey we've rewritten solid start now three times um we're about to we're about to get to the release what I call the third time or beta two. And, nice. and the idea is like the, the base solid start project. If you just like take the bare example, it creates a five kilobyte JavaScript app. That's literally just a page. There's no router. There's no nothing. It's just, it has the ability to server render, but it's just a page that has solid JS on it. But then you can add your router. Basically our meta framework isn't tied to an individual router or metadata thing. You can just add a solid router in it. Um, and now you have routing it, it all kind of layers on top of each other in a way. Um, and the, the secret to us figuring that out was understanding the primitives, understanding things like server functions, understanding that file based routing, which everybody wants in their meta framework is important to save wiring. It's just a configuration file. So as long as you have a router that can understand a configuration file, which most of them can, you know, they're almost all identical. Funny enough, if you look across all the frameworks, they have a very similar, similar structure, then it's possible to put these pieces together. Um, you know, it, it, you set up a little convention that feeds into a configuration that's consumable by everyone. Now you have this mechanism that makes things a bit more agnostic. And it's it, and I realized the reason that we ended up here was because unlike most meta frameworks, which if you notice is a big VC push, you know, around the COVID time period, yeah. um, solid start isn't actually a meta framework that's like VC funded, right? We're not selling a product, um, you know, <laughs> like we're not Vercel's Next.js or Shopify's Remix or or, you know, even the Astro company is the Astro company because essentially we're trying to give people the building blocks they need to, to you know, be successful. I'm, I'm hoping that people create, um, you know, almost more opinionated layers on top. I saw create T3 app. I don't know if, if you've all seen that built on Next.js and it's, it's wonderful because as a developer, you just have all your decisions made for you. You use this database, you use this, and it's all wired together. Super easy, probably not an easier way to get started. Every piece is opt-inable from the CLI. They all work together. They're all type safe. It's a great experience. So my, my goal was never like, there's always going to be someone who has more opinions than you. Like there's always going to be someone like you need for your specific company. I wasn't going to build that and make people fight with that. I was going to give them the pieces they need so they could build that. And uh, yeah, it, it's interesting because it does put solid start in a, you know, in a, in a different place compared to, you know, right now I feel like most um, of the framework space is tightening up on the product side. You know, there's uh, I think Astro studio coming out in 2024 and, you know, next is getting 
ever more integrated with Vercel with all the, you know, like infrastructure options they have, you know, now they've got the blob storage and all the other things. What we're seeing is these products getting more polished and getting more like, like usable, like off the shelf, so to speak. Um, and here um, I am with Solid um, trying to, you know, keep things at a way that like works with everything everywhere. So I, I do see the the conflict a little bit there, but I, I'm actually really happy with the results. And it's been a long couple of years, but we are very close to getting this uh, beta out. Um, probably, hopefully I was trying to get out at the end of this week. There's a few more bugs that I need to work through, but um, I'm, I'm very happy with it because you know, it, it took us a long time. We actually built a full meta framework in a sense in the first beta. And it was like 10,000, I forget, like 11,000 lines of code across 150 files. And then with this rewrite, I delegated to libraries that were designed for these purposes. Again, modular, understanding what those building blocks were. And the current version is, of the Sol start is 1,200 lines across 30 files. Um, <laughs> so... so <laughs> you do the right refactoring you can like figure out how to like you know you just have to understand the problem space first and it it's taken everyone i feel like you know for example i mean here's a spicy take this whole past year like next 13 was like a beta for the next version of next um next 14 they've now you know learned the lessons and put it out there and it's a good place now so i can say this but like there was a year where it's kind of like here's the new thing try it see if you like it i feel like almost all of 20 23 was kind of like that like 2022 everyone made really cool demos they're like look at this cool thing we made you know we got server components we got this mm -hmm. we got this and then 2023 was like okay we're ready but we're not actually ready and we we, we all put the stuff out there and people tried and were like this isn't quite right um and <coughs> angular <coughs> angular <laughs> <laughs> i'm not an angular gd so i can say that there's a lot going on in Angular, but most of it has been in developer preview, which means don't trust this code. Don't use this code in production. It will break. It will change, probably, likely, and you won't be warned. So <laughs> I'm really excited about all the like signals, but they're not fully baked yet. And yeah. now it's a much broader roadmap of taking various iterations to build this uh, signal story uh, through and through before it's ready for the original intention. So yeah. it'll be a while still before that lands. Oh, and that's sure. probably for the better, but it's been it's become harder and harder to navigate between what's stable and what's a developer preview, meaning alpha, really. <laughs> yeah. Every everybody is in this kind of state, I feel like, uh, to a certain degree. I think we're just starting to pull out of it. I think It'll be sometime mm -hmm. late 2024 where we're going to be like, yeah, stuff's an okay place again. But we still got months of of stuff. I feel like like it's starting to consolidate now. Um, in Solid's case, um, I'm pretty happy with what we got here. I think we got some bug fixing to do, but I, I, I this points to an early 2024 release on Solid Start, which I'm happy about because that will free me up to work on Solid 2.0. Um, long time coming. Again, had to do a lot of learning, but really have been working on async and data fetching mechanisms. Signals are a synchronous thing. And I, I want, I, there needs to be an answer for async. And I mm -hmm. feel like that's going to be the, that's going to be the big driver here. We can tighten up a lot of those APIs. We can get more predictable behavior on async. Um, I think that's going to be the real game changer. I'm, I'm like mostly happy where solid is. As I said, I haven't really changed the API service all that much in the last four years. It's just that, this piece, you know, we, we have solutions, we have suspense and transitions and, you know, you know, like these primitives, but they, you know, I had to take a stab at them in 2019. I want, uh, I want to, I want to take two on it. So I, I feel like, um, yeah, for the next coming up next year, those are going to be the, the big things with solid, solid start, solid 2.0. Um, and you know, everything else kind of falls with that because when you, when you build on the core, you see, you know, well, the greatest thing I've seen since, you know, being able to build these new projects is just like how much more people are able to do with Solid compared to what they did before, right? The Solid Start was in beta. Some people went to production. We have now apps out in production with millions of users on Solid Start beta. So, you know, it, the, the, we weren't there. That was something we did not have before, right? Watching the component libraries come up, you know, stuff like Cobalt Dev, which apparently is 
a very good uh, UI library comparable to some of the best you can find in other frameworks. Um, these things are only possible because of you know time and care, or at least I believe because of time and care taken looking at the primitives to be able to build the right pieces. So I'm very excited um, to see what people are going to be able to build when they have um, you know these tools available to them. Great. Well, that was the only question I ha I had for you today was what was what are you excited about in Solid and it's all these things you just talked about. <laughs> yeah. so I got my answer for sure. There's a lot to be excited about. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's always hard when you, like, this is the hardest part about this time period, like, when, you know, all the developer previews, because it's both exciting and it's also mm -hmm. kind of shaky, because, like, in some ways you're like, I've done this stuff, but, like, it's not released yet, and it's, like, it, it needs to, like, it's that last mile that always takes the longest, so... I am excited now because it's been a long year. We haven't like officially released very much in the past year or so, but next year looks like when it, all that stuff's coming. So, yeah. Exciting. Have you felt like generally, um, this isn't exactly solid specific, but more just, you know, ecosystem um, level kind of thing, but have you felt like everybody has been speeding up in terms of, feature and product development like all of the frameworks it just seems like we're, we're getting there's an onslaught of new features and new capabilities like every single week across all of the different frameworks i can't even keep track it's like yeah. <laughs> everything from lit to you know blazer like the whole spectrum everybody just seems to be releasing things constantly <laughs> Yeah, I, I, this is this because the the signs are like there that things are changing, right? Um, and uh, like there's a, that time period initially when you know that change is coming, where you know if you're kind of ahead of the game, you can take your time and figure things out. Like React has been telling us in one way and another that server components and this new model are going to come for about five years. Like suspense, like the whole thing that they've been trying to build, they announced it in 2017, I think, and then it finally started trickling out. Uh, sometime in, uh, I want to say 2022, mid 2022, but like wasn't really there, you know, in their own words until the next 13 release, uh, you know, like, it, like we're getting, when you see the big players move like that, there's opportunity for everyone, like the little players too, because it shakes things up. So I think everyone feels this pressure. They're like, okay, if React's changing the model and it's kind of like, it's a good time to say, like, pull out these new mm -hmm. things and, like, try and push for it. Because, like, this, maybe this, will, when the big, big dog changes, there's always, like, that moment. Like, I, I'm, do I, I, with you guys, I don't have to bring up the Angular to Angular 2 migration, I uh, assume, but, <laughs> but, like, like, when, when the know. most, when the most prominent <laughs> solution is tra changing in a radical way, the, it, everything's on the table again. Because, like, you know, is it an ecosystem reset? Is it like, 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 does it change the way we do stuff so fundamentally that, you know, the fact that they have more users doesn't actually matter at this exact moment in time because everything's going to change anyways. And then it's like, who can provide the most exciting new novel solution to these problems? Um, and it's an interesting one because you'd think, okay, how many times can you do this? Why do JavaScript frameworks keep on coming or going or whatever, you know, so to speak. And it's because the capability has been evolving, right? At the beginning, JavaScript was just like, let's enhance this server rendered HTML we have a little bit. Next thing you know, we get eventually to like single page apps and like we're actually building the whole app in there. But guess what? Single page apps don't completely scale. So especially they don't have good page load time. And, you know, a lot of companies that build websites want to make money. So like e-commerce is a big thing in that zone, you know, especially when you have like deployments and stuff like people like for sell were, you know, perhaps incentivized to have fast loading, you know, pages. I know working Marco built by eBay again, th that um, this was very important to have, you know, performance server rendering. But the truth of the matter is a lot of the solutions in the space. Okay. Now the page shows up faster. Now there's the next bottleneck, right? Like they didn't all have partial hydration or islands or like initially. So then it's like, now we have, too much JavaScript that's taking, that's slowing us down, you know? So then it's like, how do we reduce the JavaScript? And then like, you just keep on rolling, um, so to speak, uh, after these problems, right? Like at one point, the, our worst problem was that the browser was slow to update, um, you know, because JavaScript is slow. Now we're at a point where it's like, you know, 
we're worrying worrying about microseconds on page loads and like just smoothing out the whole experience and uh, and a lot of people can say well i don't need this which is perfectly fine because you you might not but it's 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 very hard especially when there's incentive there uh, probably financially for you know to actually take these techniques and stuff because a lot of the techniques that um, that we're seeing evolve in the server space have existed privately within larger companies for quite some time. That's why I mentioned Marco. Marco was open source, which made it an anomaly, but they were not the only ones doing streaming and partial hydration type stuff, um, right? Google had Wiz. There's, there's, there, there is, right? It, it was weird that eBay open source their library that worked like this in 2014, but we're seeing this, you know, now influence frameworks like Quick or React server components are actually, again, a technology that's very similar to the, um, islands or this partial hydration solutions or, you know, stuff, their version built internally at Meta. You you always hear, you know, Dan Abramoff or whatever, when he's talking about them, he's always talking about, uh, was it XMP or whatever? Or X, I can never get the acronym right. But like, basically, they had systems at, at, at Meta that, you know, it existed externally, maybe they're in the PHP. Now they're trying to bring them to their public facing JavaScript framework. So it's not like the technology here is absolutely new, but it, this is the first time that it's, and I think it's largely related to things like the edge and infrastructure, things like the fact that we have these monolithic JavaScript, uh, you know, like frameworks to be able to implement them in a way that we can get them the end user. Trying to build the same pipeline inter that you they internally use at Meta or eBay or whatever and <laughs> give it to the end user and go, here, go, it's, it's not going to work. It's, it's, it's way messier than that. And there's too many pieces. But if we control all the sides on the framework, we can have like the light version, so to speak. And we're getting to a point now where we can actually deliver on that. And again, not everyone might need it. But if you could, and the DX, you know, developer experience is good, like why can't everyone why benefit? Yeah, absolutely, 100%, right? And that's that was kind of what I was saying before, we're, we're pushing things forward because we can, but um, some people just are fine with the status quo, right? But, you know, like, oh, and that wasn't, you couldn't do that five years ago, so why, why, why could you do that? You know, well, and, and <laughs> this is where my concern has come in, because I want to take people along the ride with me and it's 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 hard when someone comes in and just is like you need a rewrite essentially because the hardest piece there is a lot of these changes are so fundamental that you have to change them at the root which makes it difficult right uh you, you now the entry of your application change it's easy that you, you like change things at the leaves like be like okay i have a new component in this framework and i just inject it over here but to actually like switch the core at the root is much harder and things like React server components are asking you to change that. It's things like Quick are asking you to change that. So a lot of my work actually in the, my focus on primitives is I'm asking the question, like, is it possible to take an app written in a certain architecture and get people to be able to progress on that line? This is why I told you that first solid start example, that's five kilobytes. Well, that's a client rendered. It looks like CRA. Like it, it literally is a client rendered uh, CRA create React app for those not aware. It, it, it's like a client rendered app. And in Solid Start, you can just switch a switch and now your client rendered app is server rendered. And it follows all the same paradigms, all the same, you know, uh, you know, routing and all the same patterns. That was really important to me that someone could take their client side app and basically make it a server app and then take into partial hydration islands, server components into the future, all under uh, the same pieces. So that that that's been one of my goals, and I, I, that's where my biggest concern is because I think we we're getting to a point right now where we've jumped ahead on the technology, but people haven't had the chance to catch up. And I really want to help find a, a path for people trying to move forward. Cool. Well, I think that's a that's a great time to um, start wrapping this up. Lars Santos, do you guys have some more questions for Ryan? I think yeah, uh, we, we have like asked enough questions to Ryan. I mean, uh, so we generally ask in case you want to promote something like apart from Solid. Of course, we are talking about Solid, but do you have anything else which you want to promote? Uh, I I've been I've been so heads down recently. It's it's uh, it's it's been tricky. I uh, it's funny because I used to like I used to do like a lot more on the streaming social writing side, and it feels like the last few months I've been focused solid, solid, solid. So at the moment. Um, I am, I am, I'm very, uh, solid focused. Uh, and I'm very happy that my employer and Netlify has 
uh, m managed to support me in this uh, because I have not been as present on the Netlify <laughs> stuff. But I, I should actually give them a quick shout out because I've been actually very impressed uh, with a lot of the recent releases that Netlify has been doing. Um, it helps me as a framework author a ton. They've been releasing a, a lot of these primitive pieces, things like building their edge functions off these, uh, like their whole invalidation scheme of just uses like traditional cache headers. Think, things like uh, new image content pipeline, things like, uh, uh, sorry, um, th like Netlify has been working very much on building these little pieces. Sorry, I was gonna mention the new KV storage, um, we, new blob nice. KV storage. So they've been doing so much work to build all these pieces. And I just, I, I'm like finally getting to the point now that Saul starts getting to where I need to be to actually like play and integrate with all these. Um, but I haven't that much yet. So I've been working so solely on solid, but yeah, I, I'm giving them a little shout out just because I've been very impressed at things were quiet for a couple of years. And then it seems like this whole fall last couple of months, they've been just releasing amazing feature after amazing feature in really quick order. Um, so very, very proud to be part of that company. Even if, uh, the last couple of months I've been very focused on solid. That's, that's I mean, fine. I yeah, because I, I saw this NX integration and Angular integration. So do you saw that trend? Oh, sorry, last chat, or Jay. So they have new, so once you like, uh, they identify if you have NX or you have Angular, and then they give you a deployment page where you can actually configure your commands. So it's, it's, it's they're just making yeah. it really easy. On Netlify? Yeah, yeah. Netlify. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, no, I, the, there's a frameworks team that's been working tirelessly. I know for a while there, there's a lot of like Next.js was the big player and it took a lot of time. But um, focus on primitives is nice because it benefits everyone. So yeah, I, I'm very happy uh, just to see these pieces um, come together. Yeah, uh, mentioned the new Angular and Annex integrations. Yeah, the, I, I'm not on top of all of them. But yeah, I, I, what we've seen, especially I guess as part of Netlify's switch to more enterprise focus, is um, these kind of solutions pop up, and I'm 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 very stoked uh, about it directionally because when you have the right building blocks, you know that's what empowers you to build what you need. I, I want to ask about uh, as far as you are aware, is there any SQLite support on edge workers or functions, anything like that with Netlify? Uh, we don't have, uh, a, to my knowledge, a, a, like a native solution for the, for this, um, so to speak, uh, Netlify's focus mostly has been about, uh, compose, which is this idea of putting pieces together, meeting people where they have their database and their solution. So we, it's not like we have a database offering currently. Um, we have the, as I mentioned, the blob storage, but for databases, we would uh, deter to, you know, other solutions, uh, whether they're online ones or um you know like you're you know sorry not online whether they're like cloud-based ones or whether they're you know servers or what that you run on your you within you know your other infrastructure so um yeah we, we it's not like we have a database product but we have a database pipeline product um netlify connect uh which basically wires all your data sources together under a single like GraphQL instance. And then from that, we can know all about your data, data invalidation, know what needs to re render, you know, like, uh, like for static rendering, for, you know, basically we got a lot of the core technology behind Gatsby um, with the Gatsby acquisition. Um, so that's been a big part of this new positioning for Netlify is the, this uh, kind of, data it's called connect uh but yeah this i don't know what to call it like data pipeline um so like you take these other sources and kind of pull them together which is obviously very important with a lot of these enterprise solutions where they have a whole ton of different data solutions all over their system different teams all working together and this is a lot about wiring it together rather than being like the new heroku let's say where you're like here's your database or solutions so um yeah that at least like that's strategically where the plan is. I, I'm not aware of any specific database offering. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, Ryan. I uh, appreciate you coming back on the show again uh, to talk about solid and um, solid start. We talked a lot about it as well. So everybody be on the lookout for the new, new meta framework for solid coming yeah. early next that's year. That's not a meta framework. <laughs> oh, it's not a meta framework. Non-meta framework, meta framework. Yeah. It's masquerading as one. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Good times. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we appreciate it. Um, I learned a lot about Solid and, you know, its origins and stuff like that. I had heard murmurings of sorts over the past, but I don't I don't get to work with many other frameworks um, outside of my actual job. So it's good to learn from you. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad to talk about this stuff. As you can tell, I talk a mile a minute. So hopefully everyone can uh, digest that information and hopefully it's valuable. I'm sorry if I went too far down any specific avenues, but um, I, I find this stuff all really exciting. No, you're passionate. We like passionate people. Thank you.